Oh, oh it's still working on here. Yeah, right. I thought for a minute we didn't have it up there. Uh, yeah, Dan called me. He says, when I get up, I get a little bit dizzy, and so I'm not going to come tonight. Yeah, he said, he said he talked to you about the class and everything, because he was supposed to teach the class, the high school class. For example, I don't know about John Nip tonight. He called me yesterday he, and said he had. He may be dehydrated or hyd no dehydrated. That may so be why I'm dizzy, but I get dizzy all the time when I first get up in the morning. Or, you know, and I grab hold of bedpost and stand there for a minute until it goes away, and then I go. I think it's something with age. I don't know. Walking would be difficult. be a long way. That's I told my cardiologist sure. about it. He got a little nervous at first, and I said, well, look, I've got bradycardia. I said, you know that. And I said, it's not anything that I'm afraid I'm going to fall and hurt myself. But I said, when I first get up and everything, if I get up too fast, I get a little dizzy. And I said, usually it's when I'm dehydrated. Yeah. Okay, so Dan and Vera... He did say that if uh, Danny and Joanna got off in time, they was going to pick Judy up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what he said, that she fell. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Fell in her head, landed on a pallet. Mm. Walmart should pay for that. You know so. Good. Yeah. You having problems with that again, Gene? You know they won sick? Why not? No one tells me anything. Oh. Well. That's kind of sad. It's a little better. It means I can claim ignorance. Well, yeah. Even if I knew stuff, I bet I could still claim ignorance. I guess you could. Who are these all for? Oh, different orders came in over the last month. Oh. Did you ever get a chance to see if you could copy off my class back there for Pat? Uh, no, I haven't got to that. that she was that asking about it again the other day, and I said, well, Darren and I talked problem. about it. And, yeah, I said, you and I talked about it, and me. you're going to look and see if you can do it. But, uh, it well, it's it's uh, possible. It just it takes power. Yeah, yeah. 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 Because we don't report it long. Yeah. Uh, I think that's the same one. Okay. Yeah. Right. Your, your yeah. Is, yeah. May 31st. Uh, yeah. Hello, ladies. Hello, Tommy. May 31st. How are you? There you go. Good. There it is. Hi, Janice. How are you? Downloading. Good. I imagine Hi, it was their problem, posted? and you just needed to just hit okay. the download button again. Get it to, uh, oh, are they? Yeah. Why, did you have a have them dilated today or something? Yeah. 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 Me too. Yeah. Yeah. Ron not here tonight? <laughs> <laughs> what, which, what button did you hit? 
that I did, all they had I did final was just miss that uh, <laughs> message <laughs> that was on there and then hit the download and <laughs> just clicked OK. Yeah. Well, was your OK on that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just click, click OK on that and then I just hit the download again and that caused it, that, that reforced it to start. Uh -huh. And like I said, that message indicated to me there's a typical message. Yeah, it's been you, muggy and you, hot this whole week. Yeah, I guess, and I could, so, yeah. I could not read Hello, the Tila. That to see the okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you hit the, just hit the okay. And then you're okay, then you're down. And well, and then you have to Ooh. start the download again. Janice? Yeah, yeah. Well, so happy you, birthday. You run through again, just dismiss what are you, that plenty nine? Okay, for a and time then, on this particular uh, program. Right 53? Now. I thought you were plenty nine. Uh, when, it would, when it would first come up. Older than what? Uh -huh. Really? Uh, How can you be older than plenty nine? You said you download, then you get this, and you watch the. Yeah. But then the last couple of three times, you just. Oh. See, all we have to yes. do is just yeah. well, they did multiply the, they, they nine times the five, six, line, and we got it. Fast. Oh, okay. it. It still showed it, but it, it downloaded it pretty fast. Well, so. All right, you're, you're ready to read. How about that? Ready to go. Yeah. Well, we just, well, you said plenty nine wasn't old enough, so it must be. Okay, so it must be 54 then. Well, then she's plenty nine. Because if you're older than plenty nine, you have to be 54. <laughs> Get it fixed? Good. Just, yeah, he always does. Yeah? Hello, Danielle. How are you? I'm fantastic. I'm wonderful. Oh, she's wonderful now. A while ago, she's just good. Now she's wonderful. Just walking three steps make her from go, takes her from good to wonderful. That's what can I say? You have any announcements? I uh, cannot think of any. Uh, Did you get by to see Jack Monday? Yeah, yeah I got by just before they were releasing him. He, they were releasing him. He had good spirits and everything. He said he was ready to go home. Yeah, I bet he was. Yeah. Well, he said he'd make it to that big screen TV. He'd be all right. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Robinson had to go back to the hospital. He's got fluid around his lungs and his uh, heart. This is your nephew? Uh, and his name is Robbie? Jeff, Jeff Robinson. Jeff Robinson. And he's he's back in the hospital now. Or? When? Today. Today. They did what? Get the fluid. Oh, the fluid. This week? Next week. Next week. <coughs> well, then that's not your last week. Then. Well, you go. Like, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> I'm going to leave next Thursday. So. You're going to leave next Thursday. Yeah. Well, so you're going to be here through the gospel meeting? Yeah. Or, and then that Friday. Right. Yeah. I'll be here Thursday night. Oh, okay. So you're leaving Friday, Friday morning. morning. Uh -huh. Well, we're going to miss you. But I'm glad you got a job. Oh, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I know that was so, your biggest concern. Oh, yeah. That's why I was going to let everybody know. Oh, I didn't mark it. Look at that. 
Mm -hmm. Well, I will mention it. Danielle got a job. <laughs> and she'll be sending money back to us yeah. for a party. <laughs> no, I can't. Back here, what about the sacrifice? No. A family now. I can't. I can't. Well, you don't have a family yet. I said I will have a family. Well, you can send money back before then. Oh, can I? Okay. He's going to go through that a little bit before. And we'll celebrate. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you'll celebrate. We all will. <laughs> Fantastic, Isaac. How are you? Hanging in there? Yeah. All right. Well. We are. Hello, Jennifer. How are you? Good. John messed up your schedule? He does that, doesn't he? I know. Well, Maxine helped him. Jennifer's not happy with you. If not, we can go tell everybody individually they before they well, leave the I guess, building. I guess we could do it like they did in Clarksville. How's that? They made an announcement, this is not a function of the church. Uh, we'll make sure all of our I's are dotted and our T's are crossed. And, and the internet stream is as... <laughs> yeah, the internet's off. <laughs> yeah, that'd be the key thing. They'd kill the sound as soon as I'm the, the closing prayer. Okay. What do you think, Ron? Well, that's okay. Well, she's doing okay. Okay. But anyway, well, it's going to be probably another week or so for it. We'll just say it's not a function of the church. But Are they fixing it? Or they're working on it. They had the money on it. Yeah. Yeah, that's your body to just say for just a second. Oh, body work? Yeah. yeah. We got a... Push. Push. You make that announcement, everybody. What are they doing now? Yeah. We'll see. <clears throat> Did you just mainly have... Yeah. Uh, body damage yeah. didn't and it's probably just uh, you're on a list. <laughs> that would, Ron. That would probably be better just to make the announcement Sunday uh, as they're going out the door. Just tell everybody as they're going out the door it's going to be at Maxine's clubhouse. As Okay. The members are going out the door. Yep. Jensen, I need a closing prayer tonight. Would you do that? You need a closing prayer tonight? Yes. Well, I can't say no. Well, you could, but I've already got your name written down, so. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and once I write it down, it's contract. Yeah, it's contract now. Come 
on afternoon, oh, evening. No, you, said, you could say that. Well, whatever this day is. I didn't hear that. <laughs> I don't know where I am. Hello, Wilma. I know I don't want to start the day over again. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> exactly. That's close enough. Yes. Pat, how's Jack done? He's doing good. I was having a little natural pain. Yeah, natural pain. Pain. Well, I wouldn't call that kind of pain. He's got natural though. It's natural, but it hurts. Yeah. Natural pain. Yeah. I know. That's a new chord for natural pain. Thank you, too. Sit down. Nope, sorry about that. I did it because I was not I wasn't even looking. I'm glad you said that. I sat here. I didn't show up a few times in my seat. That's right. So I got booted to the front. That's right. Bad boys always. That's what you get for not showing up. I did show up. Late. Late. Yeah. That's but at least I showed up. That's why you're sitting in the front. Don't feel bad. I used to sit over there. Well, well, she's in the front, so to speak. That's right. Yes. I'm in. Yes. <laughs> different class, different seats. Yes. That's right. <laughs> we just have to get over it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Doing good. Except for the <laughs> but I don't even know what day it, it is. So. You don't know what day it is. No. Well, I know what day it is. I just don't know what time of day. Well, I guess I'm a little late to my math class in my sophomore year. Yeah. And there's only one seat left in the yeah. entire class. <laughs> Your podium, like the seat was right there, right next to the teacher where she used the overhead projector and, and, and lecture from. I got stuck right there. She was right there. And I couldn't do anything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't fall asleep. I couldn't doodle. I couldn't do nothing. <laughs> yeah, <I'm not> <laughs> he had to pay attention. <laughs> When I was in college, we had this professor no, that's high <laughs> that loved to smoke, and every time he would, he loved to smoke, but he was also allergic to cologne. So when we didn't want to have class, we just sprinkled a little cologne around the podium. And when he came in, he'd say, "Class dismissed." I'm here. Billy is here. Count you is here. <laughs> Billy's here. <laughs> but she's not. <laughs> she picked up the wrong book. Oh. oh. One of my professors used pop quizzes as a method of getting us there on time. Yeah, that would do it. Ooh. All right, I got time to start. Isn't that the truth? We're going to finish Whoa. up the Presbyterians this evening, and then we're going to get into the Methodist Church. And uh, we'll see how far we get with the Methodist Church tonight. But uh, we had talked about the Presbyterian Church quite a bit last week, and uh, of course we talked about baptism last night. Uh, Wednesday night, uh, and the fact that they do believe in baptizing infants, and so we looked at some scriptures there as well. Now what we're going to talk about is uh, Jesus' body and blood, uh, they believe are spiritually pre pleasant, uh, present to believers in the Lord's Supper. So we'll look at some scriptures there as well. But before we do, I do want to thank Ron for teaching the class two weeks while I was gone, and I guess it must have been quite a strain on him because he left right after that. Uh, I'm sorry that it was such a strain, Rob. Need a vacation after that. Yeah. In two weeks even. Can I have a copy of tonight? You sure may. Where is it? What color are we in here? Well, there may be one over there. I got one. Mine's black. It's all King James. What color is yours, Billy? I have no idea. It's not red. You know what? I had an extra copy here, but I don't. I'll just, that's okay. I'll cheat. What'd you do? I'm good at cheating. Oh, here it is, Billy. One in the car. There you are. No, I, I knew I had an extra car. Okay. Right. This is page, well, it's slide 67, <laughs> so three, be about page 23, I think. Page 23. 20 what? 23. 23. Yes, ma'am. Extra Bible, right here. I don't know what I did with mine. 
Here, from me. use this one. That one may have pen oh. knife religion in it. <laughs> that one has itty bitty writing though. I'm well, sorry. The wrong one. No. Well, you can try this no. one, but some of these <laughs> older ones in here have pen knife religion. Yeah, they've got some pages missing or something. Really? This one may not though. This is a bolder no, print. Okay. Say that one has the bigger print. That has bigger print, so maybe you'll like that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Where did Jensen go? He had to get a Bible. It's uh, what you call it, uh, <laughs> out of battery, I guess, or something. We are so unorganized. We have a Bible here. Uh, I think all those are old kings. That's all those 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 old kings. <laughs> Jensen, would you we lead us in Jensen. prayer now? <laughs> a second time? Give us all the Yeah, tonight you're going to lead out there, but right now you're going to lead in here. Oh, because my Bible died? Yes. You weren't late, Jensen, but you are now. That's good because I'm sorry. That's great. had this plan for our Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us the opportunity to be able to gather here this evening to study another portion of your word. Uh, please be with us as we go through this lessons and learning about other religions out there that um, we know about their attacks and how we can defend our viewpoint and show, uh, show them the truth and the errors of their ways. Uh, please be with us as we go through this study. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so we want to look at this, uh, uh, what the Presbyterian Church believes here. Yeah, he can handle it. And that is that Jesus' body and blood are spiritually uh, present to believers in the Lord's Supper. They do not believe, though, that the Lord's Supper needs to be observed on a weekly basis. Okay? But when we look at what they say here, we need to understand that the Bible, uh, pictured in the Old Testament, a time that the priest ate the showbread once each week. And this is a good example that we should eat the Lord's Supper once each week. And let's go to Levit Leviticus, the 24th chapter, and let's look at verses 5 through 9. I wonder if Donna's not feeling well tonight. I noticed she's, Tommy was here. She's in Texas. She's in Texas? Taking care of some stuff down there okay. for his dad's house. Just wanted to make sure if she was sick that we yeah. mentioned her. I think she's all right. Good. Good. What was the verse again? Uh, Leviticus, the 24th chapter, verses 5 through 9. Okay. You have it, Pat? I do. Well, let's just start with you then. <laughs> and you shall take fine flour and bake 12 cakes with it. Two tenths of the ephah shall be in each cake. You shall set them in two rows, six in a row, and on the pure, on pure gold tablet able before the Lord and you shall put pure frankincense on each row that it may be on the bread for a memorial an offering made by fire of the Lord or to the Lord every Sabbath you shall set it in order before the Lord continually being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant and it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat in eat it in a holy place, for it is most holy to him from the offerings of the Lord made by fire by a perpetual statute. Okay, so now under the Old Testament, obviously uh, they recognize the Sabbath, and every Sabbath they were to eat the showbread, uh, not just once a month or anything like that, but every Sabbath. And we know that we, we go to Acts, the second chapter, and we look at verse 42, and it says, And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. We also look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, which we're all very familiar with that. Uh, Paul told the Corinthian brethren that upon the first day of the week, let each one of you lay by in store, so that we know they did that on a weekly basis. We go to Acts, the 20th chapter. Uh, Pat, uh, I'm sorry, Billy, uh, if you'll turn to Acts 20 for me. And, uh, Acts 20? Yes, Acts chapter 20. Oh, we skipped. We skipped. Yeah. Well, I, I quoted them verbally. 
I'm, I'm trying to keep you on your toes, see? Uh, <laughs> you can't pick the next verse anymore. What? Read, read verses. Uh, yeah, read verse 6 and 7 for me. Of what? Acts of Acts 20? chapter 20. Okay, 6 and 7. Yes, please. I got new glasses today, and I know that's not a really good excuse, but it's really messed up my brain. I, I can imagine, yeah. <laughs> but I don't know how it messed up your brain. I can see how it messed up your seeing, your eyesight. But Get over it. <laughs> okay, uh, 20. Uh, 6 and 7. Oh, I think I can handle that. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. All right, so here's another example where it doesn't say once a month or once a year or uh, once a quarter but up on the first day of the week. And so we all understand that. We, we're used to doing this. Uh, and yet, when you look at the Presbyterian Church and you look at some other religions, uh, they don't see the same thing. Calvin said, And truly this custom which enjoins commuting once a year is a most wicked contrivance of the devil by whose instrumentality soever it may have been determined. Uh, this was in the Institutes, Book 4, Chapter 17. And he, he went on to say, it ought to have been far otherwise. Every week, at least, the table of the Lord should have been spread for Christian assemblies, and the promises declared by which in partaking of it we might be spiritually fed. And this was in his Institutes, Book 6, Chapter 18. So Calvin, remember, was the one that started the Presbyterian Church, and he himself said that it should be done weekly, but the Presbyterians have chosen otherwise. Uh, when we look at some of the other beliefs that they have, conservatives affirm the five points of Calvinism. This is Presbyterian conservatives, okay? Not Christian conservatives, but uh, Calvinist in the theological tradition of John Calvin in 1509 to 1564, particularly in the Reformed and Presbyterian church bodies, uh, is what we're talking about here. Somewhat loosely, any Protestant who holds the Calvinist view of predestination and related doctrines. And I'm just going to hit on some of these uh, because I know Ron spent two weeks really looking at Calvinism because we do have a lot of denominations. And quite honestly, even in the Lord's Church, we have a little bit of this, uh, surprisingly, uh, as far as uh, some attitude about predestination and maybe a little bit more uh, other areas. But these five points are formatted and remembered through the use of the acronym TULIP, okay? And I'm sure you went over that acronym, right, Ron? Mm -hmm. Okay. So when we look at TULIP then, uh, the T stands for total depravity of mankind. Humans are so sinful that they cannot initiate return to God. Uh, and then the U is unconditional election or predestination. God chooses who will be saved, which makes it hard for me to understand because if God chooses who's going to be saved, then why attend services at all? Uh, because he's already made up his mind. There's nothing I can do to change his mind, according to what Calvinism uh, believes. The L, limited atonement, Christ died specifically to save those whom God chose. And the I, irresistibly of grace, God infallibly draws to Christ those whom he chooses. Uh, and then, of course, we have the P, which is perseverance of the saints. An elect person will never lose his or her salvation. And since Ron uh, spent two weeks on this, I won't elaborate on any of these unless anybody has a question or comment. Uh, Dale, when yes. I have perseverance of the saints if the elect person can never be lost on that last comment. Well, that's... That makes nonsense. Okay, uh, yeah, but... Uh, I mean, why would you want to persevere if you don't have to? <laughs> that sounds like work. Well, that's true, but we're talking about the person that God chose. 
they're not going to lose their salvation, but they might suffer perseverance. Uh, but. Uh, but I just wonder why they even wanted to persevere. Be since since anyway. you spent so much time on that, Ron, you have anything to add to it? Well, I mean, uh, as they themselves say, all five of them have to go together. One falls, they all fall, that type of thing. If one of them is true, then they're all true. According yes. To what they uh, teach. But uh, the point of perseverance saints, if uh, total hereditary depravity is true, that no one can initiate the return to God, it's all in God's hands to elect, and he did that before the foundation of the world, uh, pick people out name by name who would be saved and those who would be lost, and Christ's blood was shed only for the ones that God picked out before the foundation of the world, and God is going to call them whenever he decides to call them, and they can't resist that call, then it makes sense that that elect person, God elected them, uh, they'll never lose their salvation, it's all in God's hands. Yeah. You gotta persevere to hope that they're one of the elected ones. Yeah, yeah the perseverance, <laughs> the perseverance, the, the best we can make is not the same perseverance. But he's not talking about perseverance of the individual, but rather God's perseverance in saving you forever and ever. Patience. Uh, yeah, it's so it, it's the other, it's the other side of the argument. Yeah, it's, it's patience. Yeah. Except mm -hmm. the fact that you're gonna be here upon the face of the earth until God decides to come and take you home. Uh, but He's already decided. Who's going? Yes, Linda. So man can't persevere at all. Right. Well, okay, so we were gone, so I didn't hear. I wasn't here for his second lesson on this, but um, do they believe that there are so some that do attend and worship and live a righteous life won't go to heaven because they weren't selected, or does everyone who attends, they actually attend because they are the elected? Well, that's a good question, and, and uh, I mean, if I, as I go back and I look at the Presbyterian and I look at some of these other religions, now there are a couple of religions, uh, Pentecostal uh, will actually kick people out that they have decided is in unfit, uh, not marking them or not uh, withdrawing from them, but they just excommunicate them, so to speak. But now the Presbyterians... Uh, they just assume that the members that are faithful in attendance are the ones that have been selected by God. Uh, other than that, there's no way of identifying who's going and who's not. But everyone who's attending faithful pretty well accept the fact or assume that they've been chosen by God. Uh, which is kind of a loose thing to do. Uh, but, I mean, if they're going to live by Calvinism, they're going to accept the whole thing as it stands. Well, the secondary part of that also is if someone does actually fall back into the world to the point that uh, they think the are of salvation, they would say they would never be elected again. They yeah. appeared to be. They yeah, thought they, they were the saved, but they really were never saved again. Yeah, they, they appeared, but they never were uh, predestined by God. I mean, they were predestined, but they were predestined to hell, not to heaven. So, good question. Any other comments or questions? Okay, so uh, when we look at the major divisions or trends of the Presbyterian Church, the Presbyterian Church, uh, which is USA, uh, is the mainline church. Okay, now remember I told you what country did Presbyterianism start? I told you last week? Scotland. Scotland, yeah. Scotland. If you go to Scotland, that's you're going to see a lot of Presbyterians. Okay. Uh, the Presbyterian Church in America is the largest doctrinally conservative church body uh, of this group, uh, but uh, there are other more liberal branches of the Presbyterian Church, which I didn't write any of those down, but when you look at the word mainline, it just means a Protestant denomination generally originating before 1900, though it may have undergone recent mergers uh, from which theologically conservative congregations have separated and uh, so the Presbyterian Church in America is the largest doctrinally conservative church body of that group. Any other questions or comments about the Presbyterian Church? The ones today that are Presbyterian, do they strict, strictly to the Calvinism? Yes. Yeah. All of this information that I'm, I'm giving you on these, most of it has 
been updated around 2010. So, I mean, there's four years there that might be a little bit different, but uh, this is pretty current information that I have on these. As far as I know, the Presbyterian churches and the Primitive Baptist group are the only ones who hold to all five points. To all five Baptist. points, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Any other questions or comments? All right, the Methodist Church then. Uh, the origin of the Methodist Church uh, is a great Protestant body, though it did not come directly out of the Reformation, but had its origin from or with the Church of England. Okay? Its founder was, anybody know who it was? Wesley. John Wesley. He was born <laughs> June 14, 1703, in a parish of Epworth, Lincolnshire. And he was a clergyman in the Church of England. He died in 1791, and the church was born in the University of Oxford in England. Uh, it's historically actually, uh, or it histo its history actually began in the year 1729. Although the real turning point in Wesley's life came at a prayer meeting on May 24, 1738, when he heard the preacher read Luther's preference, preface to the epistle to the Romans and felt his heart strangely warmed as the meaning of the Reformer's doctrine of justification by faith sank into his soul. That comes from the Handbook of Denominations, Mead, page 147. It's similar to when I was in the military at, at uh, in Lawton, Fort Seal, had a captain there that uh, he was telling me about his religious experience and told me how he had had refused to accept anybody talking about religion altogether. And then one day the door rang, doorbell rang. He opened the door and there was the pastor, as he called it, and immediately. He had this great spirit over him. He fell to the floor. And when he finally got up, he grabbed the pastor's hand. And at that moment, he was converted. This is what happened to John Wesley in a similar format. Okay? So, in 1738, the conversion of John and Charles Wesley, already devout Anglican ministers, sparked the Great Awakening, a revival in England. The first Methodist society was attached to a Moravian or Moravian congregation in 1739. But in America, the first medical society, a Methodist society, not medical, was organized in 17, uh, 1766 by Philip Embry. Embry. The first Methodist church was built on John Street in New York in 1768. And the first annual conference was held in 1773. Now, in 1784, Methodist in the United States formed a separate church body. And the official organization and lawmaking body of the Methodist Church. This is some of the things that they stood for. The general conference and the lawmaking body of the Methodist Church. It consisted not less than 600 and not more than 800 delegates. And of these delegates, half are ministers and half are laymen. They are elected on a proportional basis by the annual, according to the Handbook of Denominations, uh, Mead, page 150, Discipline, page 10, 1952. Now, the Judicial Council has been created to determine the constitutionality of any act of the General Conference. Made up of five ministerial and four lay members. It has become so important that it is called the Supreme Court of the Methodist Church. As its decisions are final. The bishops who are elected for life with retirement at 72 
constitute the Council of Bishops and meet once, sometimes twice a year, for the general oversight and promotion of the temporal and spiritual affairs of the church. And this is the chief executive body of the Methodist Church. Now here's the sad thing about it is there are 35 separated Methodist bodies in the United States. 35. So they all got their own Supreme Court, so to speak, and they all got... That's what you mean by separate? The Supreme Court? They disagreed with the Supreme Court? They, they disagreed with somebody, and so they go off and start their own little group. Yeah. So, why is it important to talk about the Methodists? Well, there are approximately 20 to 40 million Methodists worldwide, and there are 12 million or more here in the United States. 12 million or more here in the United States. The church is composed of many branches, of which the Methodist church is just one. And that the Methodist Church teaches this, okay? Uh, they take this from what Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Okay? If the Methodist Church is one of the branches, the question is, where are the trunk and the limbs? The Episcopal Church is the mother of the Methodist Church. And the Catholic Church is the mother of the Episcopal Church. Therefore, the Catholic Church is the trunk and the denominations which came from her are the branches. And if you were to go to a Methodist religious service, you would find some similarities to Catholicism. But the Bible obviously teaches that there is only one <coughs> church. Uh, we'll look at. I think a lot at, of people believe that. Do what? I think a lot of people believe that. That there is only one. Oh, yeah, yeah. <coughs> and, you know, they don't call it Catholics. To, to a lot of people, Catholics are Christians. That's what the world sees it as. Do what, Janet? That's what the world sees it as. Like yes. Yeah. Gene? Were the free Methodists in the offshoot of one of these? Yes. And I, I can't remember. I saw one of those buildings here in town somewhere recently. At Acts 7 is two, or Acts 2? Well, Acts 2 is a Methodist, yeah. Acts 2 is, if, if, it's over here on one, well, it'd be, it'd be Covell it's Penn. and Penn. Covell and Penn. Yeah, and they're, they're apparently growing because they're building a huge building now. Acts 2 is kind of interesting if you're not familiar with it, how all that started. They take Acts chapter 2. And the individual who kind of started it had this attitude, it, well, you know, it's too early for mothers to get up in the morning on Sunday morning and bring their children to service and everything. So what we'll do is we'll start meeting on Saturday evening or even Friday evening after sundown. But they're looking primarily at Saturday evening is when they would meet after sundown. And that would be the first day of the week because they were going back to Acts chapter 2 and using mm -hmm. that as their their rationale for that. Well, that doesn't happen anymore. They meet on Sunday mornings. And I think they meet Sunday nights. Uh, but they do a lot of a lot of commercial things and everything that they're doing over there as well. But it's interesting that they'll start something like this, but eventually they'll evolve back to where they originally were. They have a new sign out now. They have Friday evenings. Do they have Friday evenings now? It's new. Uh, <laughs> back to the, back Let's to make the it morning. more convenient again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, originally when it started out and they were going to be on like Friday night or Saturday night, it was also going to be so that they could be very casual. That, I mean, they didn't have to dress up. So yeah. It was the way it was going to be done. I don't know if it's still that way. So, Let's look at some of the things the Bible teaches. Obviously, we are all familiar with Matthew 16, 18, when Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And, of course, the, the disciples had various answers. Uh, and, and finally, Peter spoke up and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, uh, Thou art the Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Period. Singular. Acts 20, verse 28. Uh, Kathy... 
uh, if you'll turn there, and then Maxine, if you'll look at Matt, uh, Romans 12, verses 4 and 5. You have it, Kathy? Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Okay, so this obviously was the Apostle Paul talking to the elders uh, of Ephesus. He had called them to Miletus, and he uh, specifically told them that they were to be overseers over the church, not churches, but the church, uh, that congregation uh, in Ephesus. Romans 12, verses 4 and 5, Maxine. 4 and 5 or 3 and 4? 4 and 5. Four and five. <coughs> okay. All right, I'm sorry. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Okay. So one body and we're talking about here. Of course, Paul told the church at Ephesus, he said there's only one church, uh, one baptism, one faith, and all of this. So we know the ones and everything. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 17, uh, Florence. For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Okay. And then uh, Colossians 1.18, Jennifer. He's the head of the body, the church, not churches. Uh, Gene, are you not reading tonight? Okay, Glenda, how about reading 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 12 and 13, 12 verse 13. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Okay. So again, by one body. So this is what the Bible says, and yet the Methodist Church teach that division is permissible and even desirable. So they had no problem with all of these 35 different uh, branches, if you want to call them that, uh, the separated Methodist bodies, uh, because their attitude is that uh, there are different beliefs. And yet the Bible teaches, though, that there is only one way. Uh, and we look at Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. Uh, Madison, you want to read that? <coughs> Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Okay. And then, of course, John 14, verse 6. Uh, Janice. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Okay. And then Jesus prayed for his followers to be one in John 17, <clears throat> verses 20 and 21. Uh, tell us, how's your eyes? Okay. I do not ask in behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that thou didst send me. In 1 Corinthians 1.10, it says no divisions among you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, but yet they teach it makes no difference what the name of the church members are. Uh, they, they had no problem with that, and even though we look at the scriptures and we see one church and that there should be no division among you, uh, which is a good passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, because you had basically three groups. Some said they were of Apollos, some said they were of Paul, uh, some said they were of Jesus Christ. 
And uh, they were such immature Christians that they were fighting amongst themselves. And that's similar to what you have here with denominational teaching. Uh, they don't even know for sure what they stand for because they don't read the Scriptures and see what God has to say about the subject. Uh, so they teach that it makes no difference what name the church members wear. And yet, and we're not going to take the time to read all this, but if you look at Acts, the second chapter, verses 1 through 47, we know exactly what we saw there uh, when the, on the day of Pentecost when the church was established. Uh, in Acts, the 10th chapter, verses 1 through 48, we see that as well. But let's go to Acts, the 11th chapter, and let's look at verse 1 and verse 25 and verse 26. Ron, if you would read that for us, please. Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard of the Gentiles had also received the word of God. <clears throat> then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Okay, so... If we looked at all of Acts 2, chapter 1 through 47, or verse 1, 1 through verse 47 in Acts chapter 10, what we'd see is the Bible teaches that a new name was given as prophesied in the Old Testament, which I didn't write any of the Old Testament scriptures down, but we know that it was prophesied. And we know that uh, the disciples were called Christians first at where? Antioch. Antioch. And so indeed it does make a difference what name we use, uh, even though when you drive down the highways and through the various towns, you might see several different names used for the Methodist Church or even other religions. Uh, so how do they view Scripture then? Well, obviously they do think that the Scripture is inspired and infallible, uh, that it's a sole final word uh, or rule of faith. Now, the word infallible, again, simply means without error. Uh, but if this was true, then they should be able to understand what the Scriptures had to say. Uh, but the United Methodist Church, which is one of the divisions, not just Methodist, but United Methodist Church, Scripture is the primary source and criterion for Christian doctrine, but for most, not infallible. In other words, it does have some error. It is not consistent. It may not totally agree with how they feel. Gene? Where is the scripture that says that scripture is, is not for private interpretation? Uh, I can't no, I, I can't remember the. Do you remember the. I didn't hear his question. The scripture that says that. Uh, or the, the so book, chapter, and verse that says Scripture is not for private interpretation. Yeah, it's uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, 20 and 21. Chapter 2, 20 and 21. It says, For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your fault no, you take... Let's go to the second. Second Peter. Yeah, Second Peter one, twenty and twenty-one. Yeah, one says, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly. Second Peter one, twenty, twenty and twenty. Oh, one and twenty-one. Transpose my numbers. That's all right. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. That's the one you're looking for. Verse 20. I'll get my hearing working here pretty soon, Ron. Well, now, I can I borrow your hearing aids? <laughs> Mine are uh, turned up louder than yours. Oh. <laughs> Well, then they might blast me out. <laughs> All right, so that's the one you're looking for. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. Uh, but Gina. do they not have their own creed? Well, yeah. Other uh, than the scriptures? Yeah, but remember what I said, that they had their supreme court that makes the final decision. 
so if if something comes up in the Methodist Church and they have a question about it, and eventually it gets to their Supreme Court, and the, whatever the Supreme Court decides, that's what's that's what it's going to be. So they're standing in the place of God. Mm -hmm. Yes. Just like the Catholics are. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just like the Pope. And that's Antichrist. Yes. Well, anybody who is against Christ is anti. That's right. It is. That's what anti means against Christ. So. Right. When you yeah. boil it all down, that's that's pretty much what it is. You're right. For Christ. Or you're against Christ. If you're not teaching the things of Christ, you are against Christ. That is exactly right. That's what you said. Yes. Yeah. So at least one thing they do accept the standard Protestant kin, uh, same Old Testament books and New Testament books that we have. They don't use the Maccabees or anything like that. As far as God is concerned, though, uh, they believe that uh, the and, and this is in general because each each branch might have a little bit different concept, but we're looking at the, the main group of them. The one creator and Lord of all, existing eternally as the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As far as Jesus is concerned, He is the eternal Son, fully God and fully man, conceived and born of the Virgin Mary, died on the cross for our sins, rose bodily from the grave, ascended into heaven, and will come again in glory to judge us all. Well, uh, when we think about that, they believe that Christ was in the world to reconcile his Father to us. Now listen to that. They believe that Christ was in the world to reconcile his Father to us. So let's see what the scriptures say about that now. Uh, and that comes from their, their doctrine, Article 2, Book of Dis Discipline, okay? But the Bible teaches the exact opposite of this. Christ was in the world to reconcile the world to God. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19, Jensen. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hence hath given us to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Okay. And then uh, Romans, the fifth chapter, and verse 10. Pat? <coughs> that's okay. Romans 5. Romans 5, verse 10. <coughs> For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Okay, so you see then, Christ was in the world to reconcile the world to God, but the Methodist Church believes that Christ was in the world to reconcile his Father to us. Just the opposite of, of what the Bible teaches. So did they cut down those verses out? <clears throat> no, they didn't cut those verses out. They just didn't ignore it. Explain <laughs> well, and as we get on a little bit further, of course, the United Methodist Church is by far the most liberal group that you will ever be associated with. And, and I'll show you some of the people that are members of the United Methodist Church. Uh, and you'd be surprised how many of them that are in government positions, including our president. But uh, they, they ignore other things too. For example, they have women preachers. My niece is one of their preachers. They Our call their preachers Methodist. pastors, huh? Our president is Methodist. He's United Methodist. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Jeremiah Wright was his preacher, and Jeremiah Wright is the preacher of the largest United Methodist congregation in Chicago, Illinois. So, uh, and you've heard some of the comments he makes, so you can only imagine just how liberal and how way out the United Methodist Church of Christ is. The most liberal group that, in fact, I want to say that the United Methodist Church of Christ really didn't start until about 1954. It just went way out there from the other branches. Uh, their attitude is we are saved by grace alone. When God regenerates and forgives us through faith in Christ who died for our sins. Uh, they use James 2, 14 through 26. Uh, See, Billy, that's kind of a long reading. You won't read the you whole know thing. What? You can skip me because I think my glasses have 
Rain goes my brain. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Well, I'm going to be kind to you, Billy. I don't think your glasses have wrangled your brain. I don't think they're in good shape. Don't say what you think, Dennis. <laughs> Kathy, you feel like reading that long of reading? Sure. Okay, James 2, 14 through 26. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But you do, but do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers, and sent them out another way. Whereas the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Okay, now, they take this passage, James 2nd chapter, verses 14 through 26, and they twist it around a little bit. For example, here's one thing they say, good works are necessary. They are the necessary result of true faith, but do not obtain forgiveness or salvation. Uh, they also think that man has no free will to do good without the grace of God by Christ preventing him. Uh, time's not going to let us look at some of these verses, and we're not going to look at chapters 1 through 6 of Genesis, uh, but the Bible does teach that God made man a free moral agent according to Genesis chapter 1 uh, through chapter 6. We'll look at the rest of these scriptures not next week because we have the gospel meeting next week, but the following week we'll finish up with the Methodist Church. And there's some things that's going to surprise you about the Methodist Church, particularly when we talk a little bit about the United Methodist Church. Um, I think we'll be a little bit surprised about that. So, appreciate your participation tonight. Grace of God is a free gift. If you don't get a free gift, then we can't do work. But we have no free will. So nothing free. So we have to get something free from God in order to have... Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, well, like, yeah, that's what I'm making you say. Yeah, I missed your schedule.